In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to Jesus Christ. Amen. So welcome, everyone. Um, my name is the Badger Dad, Lyndon, from TheByzantineLife.com, and I'm joined today by a dear friend, brother in Christ, fellow Canadian, and a uh, YouTuber and apologist, Alan Rule. Thanks for so much for being on today, Alan. Well, it, it, the pleasure is mine. So um, for our uh, viewers and listeners who aren't aware, uh, today's a pretty solemn occasion. It's been asked by various jurisdictions across the Catholic and Orthodox worlds to commemorate today as a day of mourning uh, the decision of the Turkish government to uh, reconstitute Hagia Sophia as a mosque. And so we're going to start uh, with a few moment with a moment of silence uh, as we as we commemorate the solemn occasion. And uh, the image that I've put up on the screen here is a uh, hierarchical divine liturgy celebrated in Hagia Sophia. And um, in it, you can see the faithful gathered around the royal doors and the iconostasis with the, with the patriarch pronouncing a blessing over them. So with this image in mind, we'll just spend a moment in silence. Amen. All right. So there's a lot to cover today. And I'm so glad to have someone with the expertise and the knowledge at hand to be able to share it with us. Um, so Alan, you do a lot of work in the field of church history and, and um, especially apologetics, Contra, Islam, and, and their teachings. And so today, uh, because the occasion that we're commemorating um, does involve primarily the relationship between Byzantine Christianity and Islam. So I suppose the thing where I'd like to start is, can you give us some background and description of how Islam and Byzantine Christianity, you know, the Christianity of Constantinople first interacted and what that was like? All right. I mean, uh, of course, Islam starts in the seventh century, right? It comes out of Arabia. And like Arabia was a place that no one really went to uh, in the Roman Empire or Persian Empire. Like if you go pre-Christ, like like Alexander the Great just w went around it. He didn't even didn't even touch it because I mean n now th there's oil there, but they didn't know that back then. Like back then it was just like some place very barren. If you went in and you didn't know how to deal with the conditions. Most Romans didn't. Most Persians didn't. You like you wouldn't survive a couple days. You'd either die of thirst or get eaten by wolves. Um, of course, it was not unknown to the Roman world. Um, they had a, a vassal state, the the, the Gassanid in northern Arabia there, and that there was also a Persian vassal state. But but keep in mind the place where Islam arose, the Hijaz. That was very deep into Arabia. Uh, the, the, there is a revisionist theory that uh, it started further north in Arabia, but I don't buy into that. In fact, I've got a YouTube video, uh, a long YouTube video, um, trying to argue against that theory. And I think I've, it's basically got no evidence for it. But, but the point is, that's a part of uh, the, the world that Islam comes from. Now, keep in mind, in the sixth century, so this is 50, 60 years prior to Islam, you have a, uh, a, an emperor by the name of Justinian. Um, and he ruled in the mid uh, sixth century. And he's famous for a couple things. He's famous for building the 
Hagia Sophia, which is the, the, the building we just talked about, which is being mutilated today uh, by the, the modern Republic of Turkey. And, uh, and he's also famous for waging a lot of wars. Now, now, as you know, wars cost a lot of money. Wars have bankrupted nations. Just ask George Bush, you know, how much money has America spent on his wars, you know, f fighting on the other side of the world. And so uh, uh, if you take a look, there's a, a fellow named Procopius, a sixth century Roman hi historian. He wrote a book called The Wars of Justinian, where he talks about his wars against the Persians and, and various other factions. I, I think he's got four groups in there. And of course, these wars, he was successful. His general uh, Belisarius was very successful in conquering a bunch of lands back for the Roman Empire. Uh, they didn't quite get Rome. Like mm -hmm. they were on the brink of getting Rome, but they didn't get it back. But they, they gained back a lot of land. You know, the, the Roman Empire was coming back with a vengeance. And um, it says in this book, The Secret History by uh, Procopius. Also, it's a book where he talks very unfavorably about Justinian and talks about some of his bad things. Uh, he, he was a very flawed individual. But uh, he talked about how there were garrisons on the border of Arabia. And since he had bankrupted his empire building fancy buildings, in fact, Procopius has a book called The Buildings, which talks about all his buildings, and all his wars, he couldn't pay the people to defend the frontier anymore. Um, so then go into the seventh century, the wars with Persia continue. And um, basically from 602 to 628, so about a quarter of a century, the Romans and the Persians are in a huge full scale war. You know, it's not just like they raided the border or something like that. This was a huge full scale war. So in, in this time under the reign of Heraclius or Heraclius, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. They, um, uh, the, the empire was bankrupt. Their resources were, ex had dwindled. Their armies had dwindled. The uh, now this is also true with the Persian Empire. The, the Persian Empire was essentially gone. I mean, it was there, but I mean, it was there for the taking. And so, and of course, in that part of the world, you had the uh, um, the holy city of J Jerusalem. You had um, the city of Antioch, which were important centers of Christianity. You had Constantinople. But that was further north, and then you uh, you you also had Alexandria. Unfortunately, Alexandria had fallen into the monophysite, sometimes called miaphysite, uh, and and of course that error was actually prevalent as well in Syria and actually the Holy Land as well. And in fact, when the Muslims invaded, they they thought it was God trying to judge them for the uh, Menophysite heresy. And, uh, then th they ended up conquering, um, that entire part and that whole part of the world with the exception of the crusade has been under Islamic. And I guess it's now under J Jewish control in the case of J Jerusalem, but, um, Basically, that's a Muslim-dominated re region going forward. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> while they managed to take a lot of area from the Roman Empire, they had got into Anatolia. They sieged Constantinople once in the six, six 670s. This is kind of debated whether these were raids or like a full-scale siege. Um, but then they were eventually pushed back out of Anatolia. Then in 717 to 718, there's a year long siege uh, of Constantinople by the Caliph of that time. 
I think it was uh, the one after Caliph Abdul Malik, because because uh, Caliph Abdul Malik, he's the guy who made the Dome of the Rock in uh, J- J- Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Uh, he actually had a pretty good relationship with the, the Christians and the Romans. Mm-hmm. But then uh, it, it's either the guy after him or the guy after him. Mm-hmm. I think it was two caliphs down there. But um, they they had a huge siege of Constantinople that, that was like 120,000 men, naval blockades. Um, but... It was unsuccessful. And the siege actually ended on the 15th of August. And since that's the Feast of the Assumption of of Our Lady, they dedicated the uh, victory to her. And she, they believe she watched over the city. It's chronicled in this um, work here, the Chronicle of St. Theophanes, the, the Confessor. He's uh, a ninth century monk in Constantinople. And he talks about it. Um, you can go pick it up. It's not that expensive. It's a good book if you want to learn church history of this point uh, in history because there's not as many sources as there were in centuries prior for that time period. So um, so they d- dedicated it to Our Lady. Now, in the years that pass, not long after that siege, a couple decades later you have what's called the the iconoclast controversy which was very devastating for eastern uh christianity the greek christianity now now keep in mind at this time the latin and the greek church are one church you have the monophysites but the uh so like the coptics the syriacs the, the armenians had separated but the greeks hadn't separated yet that would happen in century that would happen in the second millennium but you had <clears throat> uh, uh, Leo the Assyrian. Um, he, he starts getting rid of the icons because he is like, oh, look, the Muslims, they don't have icons. If you go into a Muslim mosque, there's no icons of Jesus or or Muhammad or anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, the Old Testament law. And and so he essentially adopts like a, a Protestant Puritan interpretation of, of the commandment in Exodus 20 w- w- that talks about graven images. And then he starts slowly. He takes him out of the imperial chapel first and more and more churches. And then eventually he bans it across the, the empire. Mm-hmm. Are, are you still there, Alan? The uh, monastery in Sinai in Egypt. They have some of the, the that's a place I want to go sometime oh, this lifetime because. Oh, sorry, sorry, Alan. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I, you, you cut out there for a second, so you might just have to repeat the last thing you said. Oh, okay. So uh, St. Catherine's Monastery right. in Egypt, mm-hmm. it's a Greek Orthodox monastery. It's yes. not Coptic. They have some of the only uh, pre-iconoclast icons I- in the world. So, I, I mean, if you want to, because all the icons we have now, Are it's post-iconoclastic. Exactly. Um, I mean, they're still nice. I'm not, I'm not mm-hmm. knocking that. But like to see a whole new genre, you have to go to that monastery in Sinai. Yeah, I think it's the oldest... It's the o- oldest continually inhabited uh, monastery in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Like it's hmm. been, it's been, it's been a monastic foundation uh, for the longest, like a continuous monastic foundation, right? Because you know, even Monte Cassino was destroyed and refounded, and all all of these all of these yeah. things. So, my for my recollection, uh, Saint Catherine's is is the oldest stand. Yeah, and we need to remember that Egypt was a birthplace of birthplace of monasticism. You know, that's where Saint Anthony the Great was. Amazing saint, by the way. He's got a great biography written by Saint yes. Athanasius. Uh, so, so pick that up and read it. It's short. You can find it online for free as well. Oh, yeah. And um, so, and so, basically, the empire is plunged. And 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 he also hoped that this would help convert. The Muslims, that didn't work, and they had 
destroyed all the most of the icons in the empire like they had like the people that defended the icons would take them down and hide them um and then and then ironically the the, the romans or the byzantines whichever you want to call them started to have some victories against the Arabs, m military victories. And so it's like, hey, maybe this is working. So, so that just prolonged the whole event. And of course, th his whole iconoclastic controversy, uh, it helped weaken th the relationship between the, uh, the, the papacy and the um, R Roman Empire because you had the the Roman Empire going going into heresy, and they're like, ah, oh, let's just <laughs> we're done. Let's just go with the Franks now. Let's team up with them. You know, let's seek their protection. And they they ended up seeking protection with various Western powers. And um, now, not a separation. They just said we we don't trust the Roman emperors anymore. So then. Uh, so essentially the Muslims haven't converted and by the ninth century, they've restored the iconography. Then you have something, I'm not going to go into it too deep, but <clears throat> in the late ninth century, it's something called the Phocian schism. That's not really to do with Islam, but it just continual, continually weakened the relationship between the Greeks and the Latin church. Now, the part that's unfortunate here is, well, a uh, uh, part that is fortunate is that the Arabs have run out of steam. They can't really do jihad anymore. They've settled down. And so in the, the late 10th century and early 11th century, the, the Roman Empire headquartered at Constantinople is able to, it's starting to expand again, just like it was in the sixth century with Belisarius and Justinian. It's starting to expand again. And uh, because the Arabs have kind of, you know, they're slack now. And they're kind of at peace with the Christians. The Christians live pretty well under their rule. Then, um, so in 1030, 1040, things are looking very good for the Roman Empire. In fact, in nine, sometime in the late 900s, I can't remember the exact year, they took back Antioch. So they're going down and they may have eventually reconquered all that they had prior to Islam. But it was not to be because uh, the Turks had just come through Persia and they're, 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 in, they're in Eastern Anatolia. And the... Uh, Byzantine Emperor in Constantinople. I believe it's Romanos the Fourth. I could be wrong about that, but anyway, he marches his army out to central Anatolia to try to defeat the Turks, and is absolutely defeated. This is 1071, and of course the Turks are Muslim too, but they're not Arab. Like the Arabs have mellowed down, but the Turks have only converted about a century prior. They, they got the fresh blood for jihad. And so they just invade all of the Middle East and Anatolia. And they take over Jerusalem. They have no respect for the, the Christians there. They're destroying churches. Uh, they're persecuting the Christians, harassing pilgrims. <laughs> they're even persecuting Arabs too. Um, despite the fact they were of the same faith. And they had taken over about 95% of Anatolia. <clears throat> now, in 1095, of course, the... Now, now, at this point, keep in mind, the Turks are... For the rest of the Byzantines' history, the Turks are involved. And the Turks will... <coughs> the Turks will eventually bring it to the end. Mm -hmm. And you had uh, the Crusades, and of course this was the Byzantines appealing for help. Uh, and so the Crusader armies come, and they're successful. And 
clearing a whole bunch of land for Anatolia and the Roman emperor, I believe it's Alexius, is just following up with his army, just taking back all the land. Then they get down to Antioch. And then, although they do take, take Antioch, the siege looks like it's floundering. It looks like it's not going to happen. So a guy named Stephen of Blois abandons the crusade. He's going back up and he's, he catches up with the Byzantine army. And he said, it's useless. Uh, go back to Constantinople, save yourself. So anyway, uh, the crusaders find out about that and then they get mad. They're like, well, screw them, you know? <laughs> and then it only, what was meant to bring them together actually tore them further apart. And so um, eventually they end up taking Antioch and J Jerusalem because the, the Fatimids in Egypt had taken back Jerusalem from the Turks because uh, the siege of Antioch had awakened them. And so you had, so the Turks had been defeated and the, the Seljuk Turks are in two parties. Now you got the traditional ones and you've got the Sultanate of Rum. Rum means Rome. They pretended to be like the Turkish version of the Roman empire, right? The, the Turks were always envious of the Roman empire. In fact, when uh, when they finally did conquer Constantinople, the, the Sultan proclaimed himself to be the Roman Emperor. Uh, so then, th the Turks at this point, the Seljuks kind of fall from power, and um, basically the Crusader states are weathered away. In the late twelve hundreds, the last of them falls uh, because of the Mamluks in Egypt and and now at this time the Turks are regrouping Turks are regrouping under a new empire and this is the Ottomans now start small but in the 1300s they start to take over the remaining parts of Anatolia and um, then eventually uh, Manuel the second they they essentially tried to assassinate Manuel the second, who was the third last emperor he He was the father of both John the Eighth and Constantine the Eleventh, the two brothers who were the last Roman emperors and then in the late thirteen hundreds and and I think early fourteen hundreds they're like constantly sieging Constantinople, but it's of no avail because Constantinople's walls are are just huge. Um, so they, uh, the siege ultimately fails, but they have to pay a tribute. Now the siege fails because you had Tamerlane invading Anatolia and Tamerlane just comes and messes up Anatolia and then leaves. And the, the that like actually kind of saved Constantinople for another 50 years or so. Because they, they essentially had to, they, they had something called the Ottoman Interregnum, where basically it was a 10, 15 year period where the Ottomans were fighting for power. Uh, like a sultan would be sultan for six months. Then it was, it was like a constant civil war. Right. Now, you would think the Romans would capitalize on this, but they were too weak to do anything. So then, um, when they uh, event, eventually, a guy named Mehmet the First comes to power, and he's not bad. He's tolerant toward the, the Romans. Then there's this guy named Murad the Second, who's a really nasty guy, and he sieges Constantinople in 1422, and it was ultimately unsuccessful. But they came closer than they ever had, and then. His son, Mehmet, uh, in 1453, uh, assaults Constantinople, and on May 29th, the city falls. Uh, so, and of course, the, the, the church, the, the Hagia Sophia, was mutilated and uh, changed into a mosque, and it is a mosque again as of today. And, but... At this point, you could pretty much tell 
that the relationship between between Eastern Christianity and Islam was one of constant friction. There was friction on that border. Of course, the border was always changing, but and the r- real saviors of Islam, in my opinion, were the Turks. Because you had the Arabs, they had their century of jihad, and then they're finished. The Turks had about six centuries of jihad. Like the Turks, like as soon as Mehmet conquers Constantinople, he goes on invading other Christian lands. Um, like he invades tons of the Balkans. He yes. goes all the way up to... Um, he slowed down in Albania by uh, by the Catholic leader Skanderbeg, who's awesome, by the way. Uh, if you you go to Albania, Tirana, the capital, there's th- this um, huge statue of Skanderbeg. It's, it's called Skanderbeg Square. Um, it, it, it's a great picture, and and he really stalled Mehmet the Conqueror because, of course, their goal was to capture Rome as well. Like, not New Rome, but Rome, Rome. And they finally suppressed the <clears throat> the Albanians in 1478. Keep in mind, Skanderbeg dies in 1468, but they kept fighting for another 10 years and managed to hold him off. Then he's very advanced in age, and then uh, they send an army into Italy, and they set up kind of a beachhead at Otranto. And... Um, that uh, at that time, Sultan Mehmet died. He was probably poisoned by his son, uh, Bayazid. And under Bayazid and his son, Selim, who was the father of Suleiman. Uh, so, so under those two sultans, they really start confiscating the churches of Constantinople. They'd taken Hagia Sophia the day it fell, but but there were still many glorious churches in that city. You got the Kora Church, the Pamakaristos, the Lips Monastery, the Studai Monastery, the just, just so many, because keep in mind, this was the capital of the greatest Christian empire. There's going to be churches everywhere. And of course, as when you're a Christian in an Islam, see, a Christian's allowed to live under an Islamic caliphate. He has less rights. He can't preach his faith. We're commanded to preach the gospel. Remember the great commission of our Lord at the end of uh, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, you can't preach to the Muslims. Uh, you have to have your bells taken out of their churches. When when Hagia Sophia fell, they had all the churches had to have their bells removed. The only thing you could hear was the call to prayer, the Islamic call to prayer. And so eventually you have all the, now, now keep in mind this, the city of Constantinople expands Mm -hmm. and the, by the year 1600, take a guess, by the year 1600, Lyndon, take a guess how many churches were left inside the walls of Constantinople. Oh, I have no idea. Five. Three. 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 In this one capital of, of Christendom. Uh, they had all been converted into mosques. I think the, the Hagia Arena was converted into an armory. But the point is, they're not churches anymore. And uh, it was used for like the headquarter of the Janissaries. And so from this point forward, now that Constantinople was taken, they had expanded into attacking Latin Christianity. Yeah. They had conquered all the Greeks, all the Greeks by 1453. And like, let's back it up. Even prior to 1453, the vast majority of Greek Christians uh, were already living under Islamic law. They were just one Constantinople. That was the, the one island of Christianity in the ocean of Islam there. And um, they, uh, but, you know, with Constantinople, th- there was always that hope that one day there'd be a new J- J- Justinian and he would, take it all back and flush the Turks out of Anatolia. Obviously it didn't happen. But, uh, 
And so pretty much to this day, and followed by the Turkish nationalists in the, like, if you go back in, into the 1800s, the Ottoman Empire is starting to secularize. Pretty much because everywhere else is starting to secularize, you know, the, the, the nationalism that Napoleon had brought everywhere is starting to have its toll and they're starting to secularize the laws of Turkey. And you would think this is good for the, the Christians and it was for a bit, but then uh, you have these radical Turkish nationalists in the, uh, the 19th century who who commits the greek and and the assyrian and armenian genocide all of which turkey denies to this day um i I had one say it's not a genocide it was a mass murder it's like well if that makes you sleep at night well then (laughs) um yeah and so basically turkey the 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 ottomans the turks have made huge blows to Christianity. And keep in mind that until 1453, there was a huge faction of the Greek church, not huge, but a significant faction that wanted to reunite with the Catholic church, the Latin church, as they called it. And um, it really... And, and as soon as 1453 happens, the Sultanate, the, the Ottomans, they keep an eye on who the, the patriarch is of, Istanbul, of Constantinople. And um, they make sure that the anti-unionists are favored. Because keep in mind, at the last couple decades of the Roman Empire, the, the, the Romans were in a union with the Catholic Church because of Florence. Um, the last emperor, Constantine the Eleventh, was officially a Catholic. There's no evidence he repudiated the the the, the Union of Florence. None. Um, you could say that he was just doing it for political purposes, and he may have, maybe not. I don't know. But the point is, as soon as the city falls. You have uh, the Turks keep a very close eye on the Patriarchate of Constantinople and use that office to suppress uh, the small remaining ones who were friendly, who wanted to be in communion with the Catholic Church and the Pope. And um, this was basically because the only one who could call a crusade is the Pope. And he wanted to... uh, And, um, of course, there's only a crusade if they're asking for it. If they're like, oh, we're happy under the Turks, you know. And because of that, to this, to this day, it's very annoying when I he- see this. There's kind of some Orthodox that kind of have Islamic Stockholm Syndrome where, you know, there's that famous quote by... Uh, the, the Grand Duke of Constantinople, who's like, I'd rather see the the, the Turkish turban over our city than the, the Pope's mitre or some nonsense like that. Well, he got his wish, at, at least for a couple of days, because he got executed about a week after they took the city. But um, yeah, so the, the, the point is, this has been a Christian relationship with Islam pretty much for the last thousand years. Basically, the main enemy of uh of christianity has been islam particularly turkish islam if you ask a muslim today what's the biggest crime that christians have ever done against the muslims you're going to hear the crusades right the crusades are not called until the turks come on the scene this is something a lot of people don't know they didn't bother 400 years of arabs no crusades the Turks, 25 years, no, we need to call a crusade. It's getting serious here. Um, and now the Turks, the Turkish people, are, apparently they're a lot more se- secular than they were like 20 years ago. Um, but th- they're still equally anti, 
anti-Christian. Mm-hmm. And yeah, because keep in mind, a Christian is not allowed is allowed to live in an Islamic state. But but all Christian governments or all non-Islamic governments need to be destroyed. Uh, and that included the, the remains of the Roman Empire at Constantinople, where the Hagia Sophia fell on what the city and the church fell on that horrible Tuesday, May 29th, 1453. And it's been a nightmare for Christianity ever since, especially with the Ottomans raiding the Balkans and, yes. and stuff like that. Well, thanks so much for giving us um, all that background. Uh, it's really, really informative. And I think, I think um, I am important too, because, you know, it's, it's really, it's good to, to reinforce a, you know, unbiased or at least a, a narrative that's even, you know, slightly in favor of, of the, of the Catholic church in particular, in particular, because so much of the history that again, in, in the modern uh, context is sort of like saying, uh, slanted against, you know, Christianity against Europe, you know, depending upon the, the authorship. Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to re- recommend if you want a good book on the Crusades, mm-hmm. get the new concise history of the Crusades uh, written by Thomas Madden, who, who also wrote a book about Istanbul I got here. But he's a guy to read about the Crusades. He's gone through all the primary documents. He's essentially America's greatest historian of the Crusades. And so if, if you want to learn about it, it's, it, it's an overall view. It's not the whole... It, he, he's got a book on the fourth crusade which is oh that was a nightmare <laughs> but essentially the crusaders because the third crusade under king richard the lionheart had been so successful they didn't take back jerusalem but they took back a lot of land and um the, on the fourth crusade they wanted to emulate the third crusade and while they're uh in venice they kind of get up with an XL Byzantine monarch who had a claim to the throne. His name was Alexius IV. And it seems like every second person in this whole episode is named Alexius. You know, there's so many Alexiuses. There's Alexius III, Alexius, the cousin of, you know, just, yeah. And so they end up sacking Constantinople, which is a black eye for the Crusades and the Catholic Church. You know, Pope John Paul II took great pain in that. And Pope Innocent III, he never commanded that. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, it's unfortunate, but. Yeah. So th- again, thanks. Thanks for that recommendation too. That's a, that's a really great topic, but it's a little bit uh, beyond the scope of what we're uh, hoping to achieve today. Uh, you know, there's so much again, and so much misunderstanding about the nature and what happened in the crusades and the implications um, specifically. But one thing I wanted to, to kind of move into now, uh, Alan. Um, so again, there, there, this is kind of a, a, a touchy topic. But, you know, I, I was trying to find a quote um, uh, during some of your, your exposition on, on that, on the, on the relationship in history. And, you know, it's, it's I, I, again, maybe I kind of pick your brain about this, but I know in, in the book on heresies by St. John de, of Damascus, he, he lists Islam as being one of the Christological or, you know, Christ, Christian heresies. And he, you know, it's, it's, he has a very, it's, you know, only about in, in the English translation, it's only about two or three pages, but he basically goes into right in, in, in uh, his day there, the uh, Muslims are referred to as Saracens and he explains why that is. And then he goes into some of the basic, the basic accusations um, of, of um, Islam against Christianity. And then he, ref, you know, offers a few refutations and then he, but he sources directly from the Quran. Like he's, he's saying yeah, this, this, this is what it says in the Quran and this is why it's, why it's wrong. Um, but I just wanted to read the opening line because it's kind of a, it's kind of a striking, it's kind of a striking way of putting it. So uh, this is from St. John of Damascus uh, on heresies. And he says, so there's the, the superstition of the Ishmaelites, which to this day prevails and keeps people in error being a forerunner of the antichrist. And that's how he opens opens the section. So that those are pretty strong words from a doctor of the church um, regarding this. And he's one of the early early uh, writers in this period um, on Christianity and and um, and Islam. So 
do you think that you know John of Damascus's thesis still is still um, does is is there truth to it today? Is it a uh, position that we can take because again you know we live in the era post conciliar area of nostra aetate of um you know perhaps even or perhaps even just in the development of islam that it can no longer be called a a christological heresy per se um i was just wondering what your thoughts were on that alan well it's certainly and yes i fully r recommend everyone read uh, what saint john of damascus wrote on islam and wrote about anything he's just a great saint in general i've got his book over there but i was going to grab it but you showed it uh and so yeah no he uh he quotes from the quran he's got one quote that may be spurious but like it's he he essentially knows the faith you know they say oh w w we reverence the cross but it's like yeah but they kissed the black stone how can they you know be it, it, it's a good treatise he, you know and um and, and it's not too long so you, right. you could type it into google i believe it's available online uh and um he, well the thing is you asked if it was still relevant of course i would say yes but unfortunately in this day and age the modern church is so afraid to offend anyone like the most precious thing to the modern hierarchs now to the curia now is good relationship with the muslims good relationships with the that's like all they care about it seems uh and so now d don't get me wrong me I, I believe in a policy of silence regarding islam if pope francis or pope benedict or john Paul ii didn't say anything about them I i'd understand that why because there are christians li living in muslim lands in iraq mm -hmm. syria lebanon and other muslim countries and if the pope condemns muhammad it could put their lives in danger. So I understand they want to adopt a policy of silence, uh, but that's not what they do. They go and sign all these stupid statements. Uh, Pope Francis and Pope Benedict both pray in the mosques in, in Turkey of all places, the Blue Mosque, which is not too far from the Hagia Sophia. It's a few blocks away. Uh, but yeah, so well i would say it's relevant we have to remember that islam uh part of their faith is giving dawah and part of our faith is preaching the gospel and and those are almost the same things they're preaching the faith you can maybe find some technical differences but you're both supposed to spread the faith and of course when they try to spread the faith we have to counter them you know and yeah. we need to Oh, absolutely, and Saint, absolutely, Alan, yeah. Saint John of Damascus is part of a long. Although he's probably the first, there's some debate. There's a rich history of Catholic polemics against Islam. John of Damascus, obviously, and many other people. You had a guy named Theodore Abu Kura. He may have been a monophysite. I'm not 100. percent I don't know a lot about him. But then you have Peter the Venerable, Francis of Assisi, Thomas Aquinas. Yes, then you got right. Pope Pius V uh, preach against Islam. He was a guy who sanctioned the Battle of Lepanto, the Lepanto. Holy League. Yes. And, you know, that's interesting, too, um, uh, Alan, because I think when you, when, when you mentioned about Dawah, right, the proclamation or, you know, ev evangelization, roughly speaking, in the, in the Islamic context, too, I don't think a lot of individuals are, are aware of just how quote unquote evangelical of a faith Islam is. And uh, to kind of prove that point, I've got a I've got a, a source text here. It's it's an English translation of a book by a sheikh from the um, the, the the department for for dawah the department for pro basically it's sort of like the uh, Saudi equivalent of the of the holy office propaganda fide. Um, and it's called uh, The Ideal Muslim. And it's basically a short manual. Uh, he wrote one for, e for, for Muslim men and Muslim women. And it's, short, it's sort of a short treatise or catechism in a sense of how should a Muslim man or Muslim woman act. And he lists proclamation of, of Islam um, as one of the 
one of the primary um, duties, you know, and you, you know, we think about in the, in the Catholic context, you know, the, the law, the priest, the precepts of the church, you know, um, and, 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 and those sorts of things like this is, this is a fundamental uh, part of the identity of, of, of a Muslim is, is to, is to preach their faith too. So I think, I think that, you know, a lot of, perhaps people who are uneducated on this matter just say, well, can't we all just coexist and live in harmony and I won't bother you and you won't bother me. But to be perfectly honest between, um, you know, Islam and Christianity, we're both, at least one of us has a divine mandate to proclaim the truth. And, you know, and that, so that's going to put us in opposition. Yeah, it certainly is. And of course, most Muslims in the West don't give dawah. You, you know, most Muslims in the West, you know, they just want to live their lives and like, you know, take their kids to soccer games and all that stuff like that. Um, but there are certainly, especially in England, uh, there are huge movements where they try to give dawah. Uh, if you've ever heard of Speaker's Corner, um, that's where they, they set up booths. They set up a dawah booth once a year in, in, in Calgary. In fact, if you take a look at my first YouTube video on my channel, my channel is just called Alan Rule. My first ever is my first or second. Uh, it's me at a Dawa booth. It's only audio, but I'm arguing with <laughs> some people about um, some Muslims about the faith. And, and so we're commanded to preach to them. Now, it's hard. We have a priest shortage, so it's probably not. We're probably not going to see much priests operate in Muslim lands. Like the priests that are in Muslim lands are kind of to service the few Catholics that are there. Yeah. They sadly have adopted the uh, Islamic Stockholm syndrome as well, or a form of it. Like I, I, I interviewed uh, on my channel. I interviewed. D D Durya Little, who is a, a Turk who had became Catholic. This okay. is her book, From yeah. Islam to Christ. Yeah, very, very highly recommend it. That, that's, it's such a, she's such a powerful speaker. She told me in our interview that a Turk in Smyrna went to the, the Catholic church there. Smyrna's on the coast. Yeah. And uh Goes to the his former Muslim. He finds out Muhammad's a fraud and and a false prophet. So he goes to the Catholic Church to convert. And in Turkey, you can legally convert. By law, you can convert. Wow. Uh, you'll become a social outcast. No one will. They'll think you're a CIA agent. But you're by law allowed to to convert. There's no fine. There's no imprisonment. No nothing. Mm -hmm. So he goes up to the, the, this Catholic priest and says, oh, I want to convert. And the priest just says, oh, there's no need to convert. Just be a good Muslim. And this Turk was horrified. And he eventually found a Protestant church and converted through there, which is closer to the truth, obviously. But I mean, what the, 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 that priest, just, just shame on that priest. You know, if that's how our priests are going to be. You know, because in this day and age, we don't do that. We just want to make peace with them. We don't want to disturb our precious relationship with the Muslims. That's all. That's all it is. It's, it's because now it seems like many in the church don't want to spread the gospel. They want to just have good relationships, drink martinis. Well, you're not going to drink martinis with Muslims. They do that with Jews, I guess. But, you, you know, have some Turkish coffee and discuss religious perspectives. That's a lot of what the hierarchs have, have to do. And so, yeah, yeah. and I think, I think Alan, that really comes from a, a mischaracter, mischaracterization, almost a straw man of what, you know, evangelization, you know, or even you could even use the word proselyte, proselytization from a Catholic perspective is about, you know, like they just say, oh, well, you're just going to shove a Bible and a rosary down their throat and you're not going to you know, care about them or their feelings or, you know, try to reach to them as a person. But that's, that's so against the truth, you know, as a, as a believing Catholic of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we care about the eternal destiny of every human being on earth. 
and it is a it is a out of the out of duty to charity you know it's it it is our um duty and love you know to ch charity in terms of the traditional catholic sense of the word to to reach out to them with the gospel of jesus christ so that they can come to know and love him and have a have obedience to him as their Lord God and Savior, because that is, that is the truth of our faith, you know, and it's sort of like, how could you, how could you just say, well, you're, you're not going, you're not, you're not doing what's best for the other person by, by proclaiming that. And it's just like, how can that not be what is best for our brothers and sisters across the world? And uh, if, if you think about it, you talked about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, th that's actually what the, the, the Hagia Sophia is named after yes. uh, the Holy wisdom of God, you know, that's, uh, let me give you a quote by Paul the Deacon. He wrote History of the Lombards here. This is about the Hagia Sophia. Right. The same emperor, talking about Justinian, also built within the city of Constantinople to Christ our Lord, who is the wisdom of God the Father, a church which he called the Greek name Hagia Sophia, that is divine wisdom. So the divine wisdom of God is our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And, and obviously that church, which is being mutilated today, is, um, it, it was a testament to that at the time. And uh, so, sorry, one one quick thing. Now that oh. you 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 pointed that out really really well, Alan. Uh, in preparation for the for the show today, I was reading a bit of a. Um, it's one of the few the, uh, Orthodox theological manuals that exist because they, you know, the Orthodox typically wanted to avoid scholasticism. But you know, when seminaries became the status quo in in Orthodoxy, they had manuals because you had to teach stuff in seminary and the one I'm, I was reading was by uh, the priest Pomazansky and it's called um, or Orthodox Dogmatic Theology and he literally he lit as his he has a one paragraph refutation of devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus and he states that uh, you cannot venerate aspects of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ apart from the whole Christ and yet the the Hagia Sophia is not called, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ. It's called Hagia Sophia in veneration of Christ being the Logos, being wisdom, which is an attribute of God. God of course, God is perfect wisdom. That is that is an essential nature of the Logos, but it's also a that that name the nomenclature is veneration of an attribute so it's it's funny that you know in the 19th and 20th centuries orthodox uh theologians are saying well the catholics do this and this and this and it's horrible because of these reasons when it is equally valid in the orthodox context as well point point being hagia sophia yeah well keep in mind that uh that church was built before the schism right yeah. you know so uh, part of the like from the time of Photius in the ninth century and Photius is a really nasty character I really don't like that guy uh, like I know like um, Mark of Ephesus is one of their other pillars of orthodoxy who stood against like him. Believe it or not, I actually have, <clears throat> I actually have a lot of respect for the guy because he actually followed his convictions. Whereas those other people at the council of Florence were more or less just doing a favor for, for the emperor. So I admire him for at least sticking to his principles, but Photius is a really nasty guy. And he started this very petty anti-Latinism uh, that, really flourishes in the uh the the post-schism period uh it, it, it continues and, and it kind of evolves you know because i don't think Photius brought up azymes uh that was that was uh later on in the 11th century but like it it, it just uh, i don't know if you've read his book the uh mystagogy of the holy spirit have you read that no, I haven't, Alan. No. It, it is a absolutely 
pathetic piece of scholarship. I, I don't even want to call it scholarship. It's just an angry rant. It's like, a, like it sounds like a teenage girl who's going through that time of month. I'm not lying. It just is very angry anti-Catholic rant. Apparently, I heard this. Apparently, he wrote this towards the end of his life. Um, like long after the problems with the, the Fauchin system were over. Uh, I don't know if that's 100% true. I heard that from a guy I trust. I'll take his word on it. But, uh, and, and it just seems like this petty, petty anti-Latinism. They have to find anti-Latin stuff everywhere. Uh, and a, a, a lot of it is, now, don't get me wrong. There are things that us Catholics need to discuss with the Orthodox before we come back. That's true. I'm not going to deny that. But like a lot of the stuff, in my opinion, is just really dumb. The big thing in 1054 was not the papacy. In the famous 1054 thing with Cardinal Humbert yeah. and Serularius, the big thing there was the Eucharist, the Azimes. And of course, the Catholics have always had the attitude that... Uh, you, uh, you know, l l liturgical differences. Oh, okay. In this region, the l l liturgy eventually evolved to have unleavened bread. And in this place, it had leavened bread. And that's the same thing true with the filia. In, in fact, uh, th there's this very, uh, if you follow Jay Dyer and his crew, they try to say the, uh, Uniats are just essentially orthodox, but they bow the knee to the Pope. And that's not true at all. Uh, in fact, I'd say this, the Catholic position on the filioque is the first millennium position. Some churches used it. Spain used it in the sixth century going forward. Um, they had it in England starting in 680, Council of Hadfield. Uh, and it pretty much by the 11th century it was used everywhere but that was a decision that local synods made and then of course odious has to say oh you can't do that you know and so eventually and there's much more i could say about this i just don't want to get off topic about the the 869 and 879 council uh i don't fully trust dvornik's book i trust the sources he quotes if you ever read dvornik's book make a difference between his opinion and what the sources say, because he reads stuff into his sources. And so basically starting with Photius is the point I'm trying to make. There's this very petty anti-Latinism. It's very petty. It's very annoying. It's so uncharitable. Again, I'm not against if they want to bring up our differences, but it just becomes, it becomes so pathetic at, at, at some points. And it exists... It exists in uh, today in primarily in Mount Eight. Those uh, it, it exists with all these former Protestant converts in, in America because they they capitalize on that. Of course, m most of these people have never studied church history, but uh, yeah, and so th these petty differences really did not help the, uh, um, the fight against Islam because it took the two lungs of the church and basically separated them. They were no longer working in unison. Now, the Latins still tried to help. They still sent crusades. The crusade of Nicopolis in the 1390s, crusade of Varna in the 1440s, although both of those crusades failed. And... Um, and then eventually the Muslims overrun Constantinople, the last bastion of hope in the Greek world. And, uh, and yeah, it's a shame that building is not a, a, a church. Uh, uh, Pope Francis uh, in 2019, it was our 2018 or 20, I, I think 2019, he signed that stupid Abu Dhabi statement and and in that statement, it says we're supposed to respect each other's places of worship, and of course, of course, the uh, the, the Pope said, uh, 
a day or two after the uh, the the Turkish court decided to convert the Hagia Sophia from Museum to Moss, he said he was saddened. And then a few days ago, the uh, the president or prime minister of Greece, I'm not sure what they have, but she appealed to the Pope yes. to say, look, try to do something about it. Sure, it's a shot in the dark, but, you know, it, it, it's a chance. But the Pope was silent as the grave. Doesn't he want to help out? Like, like he's always cozy with Patriarch Bartholomew, you know? Shouldn't that mean something? But no, he doesn't want to upset the Muslims, because the number one thing he cares about is building these bridges. Like, look, I mean, because a lot of people think, and I'm it's slightly off topic, but it's important. A lot of people think, because they don't know history, oh, the past was so barbaric. Uh, look, we had the Holocaust, we had all these wars. But now in the modern age, we have to have all these agreements or we're, we're going to kill each other. And of course, Muslims and Christians have lived side by side for centuries and Jews, and we haven't killed each other. Yeah, there'd be wars every now and then, but th they think, oh, if we don't have these things, if we ever condemn them, there's, there's going to be a mass genocide or something. That, that seems to be the mindset. It's a very st stupid mindset. But unfortunately, a lot of people who have received w w Western educations, and we're starting to w w wake up to this too, like the, the Western world looked pretty good in 1946. You know, we had defeated Nazism. We were uh, on our way to defeating communism. It would take a few decades, but you know, essentially after Stalin, things start going downhill for the Soviets. And the Western way of thinking looked pretty good. Now the Western way of thinking looks absolutely pathetic. And of course, Pope Francis and all, and all the other Korea, they grew up in that world where that's all they had. They couldn't go on YouTube and find out alternative versions. And they were afraid that if we criticize the Muslims, there would be a genocide or something like that. And so now we have to appease them. So... The opposite is extreme. Yeah, the opposite. He can't help his friend, the Greek prime minister or president. I don't know what they have. His president, yeah. Yeah. She asks for help, you know. And we're supposed to, uh, to be honest, I'm against dialogue with with the Orthodox. I'm not anti-Orthodox, but I don't think we should be doing all this dialogue. with stuff. But Pope Francis does that anyway. Shouldn't he at least stand up for his, his friends and the the Greek church, you know? Yeah, it would appear but so. No, he did not Yeah. And so it, it, this is very depressing. And I think the reason why today the Hagia Sophia, and I believe it was equally insulting to be a, a, a museum as a mosque. I'm one of the only people who thinks that. But I think it, it's the reason that Hagia Sophia and all the church, and that city is still in the hands of the non-believings of the godless Turks, because they don't have the true God, their God is an idol. And th that's true if they believe in, in Islam or the Mustafa Kemal Ataturk's Freemasonry nonsense. Um, the reason it's not a Christian city is because we haven't worked together with our fellow Christians to bring them in and to work toward preaching the gospel. And converting the Turks. How many missionaries are in Turkey? None. You've got a few priests there to service the Catholics there who are probably Polish, Italian, Filipino foreign workers. But uh, those priests, that priest in Smyrna who turns away that Turk who wanted to leave Islam. Like, like what kind of attitude is this? It's all about maintaining the relationship. That's, that's the most precious thing in my opinion in the minds of a lot of bishops uh, of the church having a, a warm relationship with the muslims and the jews and 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 them yeah let's put it that way so yeah i think i think that that's sort of why it's important today alan that we do take some time i mean it being a friday obviously we we're called to fast um 
And, you know, maybe today would be a time to offer up our fasting and penances, um, not only over the over the the conversion of Hagia Sophia, but also for our hierarchy. I think that that's that's something that that you know, apart from apart from you know divine intervention uh, directly into these affairs, uh, we we as we as laity you know are are called to pray and and to by our witness show show the truth of our faith even when our hierarchs seem to be working contra contrary to that. So I think that that's that's sort of where. Um, where, where we're called to today as, as, as laity. And the thing, the, the last thing I wanted to kind of uh, touch upon, I know I've taken up a lot of your time already, Alan, um, is um, the, the importance, because I mean, we, we, did, we did kind of end on, on some of the tragedy, you know, even of being turned into a museum for, for Hagia Sophia. Um, you know, so what is, what is the importance of this building? You know, to, to you know, again, there's a lot of, there, there can be a lot of different interpretations, you know, it's just a building, you know, yes, it was a church and that was nice, but now, you know, someone else is in charge so they can do whatever they want with it. And in the end, it's just a building. Well, something that um, uh, the Archimandrite, the late Ar Archimandrite Robert Taft, he's one of the most um, pro prolific uh, lit liturgical historians, at least in the English language of, uh, of uh, Byzantium. Uh, in his, he's got a very brief text, but it's, it's kind of fundamental, the, um, a short history of the Byzantine, right? And basically he says, you don't have a Byzantine liturgy, like in terms of it being a sep separate from, you know, first millennium, you know, the, the joint, the liturgy of, of the ages, the, the liturgy that's, that's common to both the West and East. You don't have a particular right without Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia is what creates or lays the foundation for the development of the Byzantine rite. And so, you know, that's, that's not an unimportant thing, you know, especially for me being a Ukrainian Greek Catholic and, you know, all of the Byzantine uh, churches sui iuris, we owe our liturgical life, which is right, the source and summit of our faith to the, the development of this building and the, and the history following that. So, uh, do you have any any comments on that last on the last topic there, Alan? Well, as far as I know, the Hagia Sophia is uh, certainly in the Greek world the largest church or building that was a church. Um, I don't know of any other buildings in the Middle East that have it. Maybe there's a new one in Greece. I know they're starting to build they're currently building it's been under construction for some time a church in uh, serbia belgrade i saw that in 2014 when i was in serbia in uh, st petersburg there's a large orthodox church there of of equal caliber but again those are modern churches the the hagia sophia was built in the sixth century like for um for centuries after that, the mosques that the Ottomans would build in Constantinople are all modeled after Hagia Sophia. They tried to make a larger dome. The dome of the Hagia Sophia is legendary. Like they tried to build a mosque that was bigger, but the dome would always be smaller. Like the, the Hagia Sophia is an architectural marvel. Yes. And um, so it, it like, Justinian, I have problems with Justinian. Again, read Procopius' The Secret History. He did some bad things. But in terms of, you know, kind of uh, like accomplishments, like he built that building and it's one of the oldest buildings in the world and it's one of the largest buildings in the world. And it's still there. There's tons of buildings from the ancient world that are no longer there. You know, you don't have the hanging gardens of Babylon anymore. You don't have the lighthouse at Alexandria. You don't have the uh, the temple of Herod, you know, like they're all gone, you know. Um, of course, we have other things, but of ancient structures, that's pretty much the largest the largest we have. And, you know? and I think St. Peter's Basilica was modeled after it as well. Was it? I'm not. That, that's that's my understanding that it was it was modeled after after Hagia Sophia. I could I could be mistaken. But that was my the understanding. modern St. Peter's. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, because I know the modern St. Peter's was built in l- around the 1500s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, no, and I think we should all take a look at that building. Just go into social media mm-hmm. and type it into Google because the first prayers are happening today. It's Friday, which is the day of the Muslim prayers. Yes. And they've redone the interior. You can still see the icons, vaguely see the icons, but uh, it it looks so mosque-like now. It, mm-hmm. it just gross. And because, I mean... Like, for example, if I walk into a mosque, I expect to see that. But, like, if I walk into, you know, this monument of Christendom, um, I expect to see icons and stuff. Mm-hmm. And and even when Hagia Sophia was a museum, it was, you know, they emphasized the Christian and Islamic history. Right. Like, they'd still have a lot of Islamic stuff there and the Christian stuff, but... Now it's uh, now it's just this horrible building. Apparently, the mayor of Istanbul was opposed to it. He even had a petition going around, and it seems like the Turks who oppose it say we have enough mosques. That's what they say, and of course, it's. And of course, that's not Erdogan's concern. Apparently, apparently Istanbul is the most secular city in Turkey. Most of the Turks there don't take the faith too seriously. Only a fraction of them do the daily prayers of the females wear the hijab. But like that's 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 like a trophy mosque, mm-hmm. a trophy of the glorious past of Turkey. We took the greatest Christian city and turned it into the greatest Islamic city. And the fact that that was a a museum kind of stood in the way of promoting our victory. It's still an equal perversion from my perspective, museum, mosque, or if they turned it into a car dealership, it doesn't matter. It's it's a perversion of of that building. But uh, yeah, he, he wants to see himself as a new... Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Erdogan. He's just an egomaniac, to be honest. He wants to see himself as like a new Ottoman sultan. And the Turkish government is actually promoting Islam internationally. I got to tell you something. In 2014, I was in Albania. Mm-hmm. Albania is about 60% Muslim, but it is liberal. Like it is very, very liberal. And there are very few mosques there. In, in, in the capital city, there's not many mosques. And so a few years back, I think in 20, 2017, 2018, uh, the, of course, Albania is a poor country, not a lot of money there. And they very, they needed, I think it was an airport. They were trying to build a new airport and it was so much money. And the, the Turkish government stepped in. They're like, oh, we'll help you out. You know, we were your... Uh, your buds during the Ottoman days will help you build your airport. I think it was an airport, but we also want to build a mosque for you. And so part of accepting that was building a mosque. So now there's a big mosque in the capital of Albania because, because most of the mosques, believe it or not, were destroyed by the, the communists because in Albania, you had some very nasty communists. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so so Turkey, the, the guy's an egomaniac. He just thinks he's some new Ottoman sultan trying to promote Islam in his own country where apparently more and more people are becoming atheists. And he's also trying to uh, to promote it internationally too. Yeah. Um, well, thanks so much for, for coming on today, Alan. I really, I really appreciate all the time and I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. We've, we've already uh, dedicated a lot to this conversation, which I'm so thankful for. Uh, so again, I'm speaking with Alan Rule and uh, Alan, what are, what are some of the ways that people can connect with you and, and your work? Where, where would you like uh, the folks to go? 
Uh, well, you can go to my website, alanrule.com. It's all one word. It's just my name. There's no hyphens or anything, alanrule.com. You can also go to my YouTube channel, just called Alan Rule. Uh, subscribe. And uh, you can find me on social media, uh, specifically Twitter, at my handle is at Alan Rule. Again, nothing too hard. My, my name's spelled with two L's, Alan. I, I think they call that consistent branding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what else am I going to call it? I'm just too lazy to think of some clever title. You know, Alan Rule. You know, I'm just. Alan Rule. He rules. Aha. Aha. There you go. You can have that one for free, Alan. I've never heard that one before. <laughs> And uh, of course, this is um, the Orthodox Show on uh, brought to you by thebyzantinelife.com. And you can head over to our website too, where my wife does a lot, uh, a lot of um, articles about the faith, home life, homeschooling, organization, and uh, but all from the context of being uh, Catholics, faithful, intentional Catholics. And you can hit us up on Patreon, on all the different social medias. We're on Parlor now. Oh, that's that's kind of like the people call what's the, the conservative Twitter. And after after it got some press recently, there was a huge insurge of Catholics going on there. But it seems to be a lot of pe- folks still prefer Twitter. So we're we're also we're also on on Twitter as well. Um, and to to send us off, Alan, I think we can also recall that, uh, uh, especially in Constantinople, there's always been uh, a great devotion to Our Lady. In the Byzantine Rite, we celebrate on October 1st, we celebrate the Feast of the Protection. In Slavonic, we call it Pokrov. And there's been so many different ap- apparitions um, attributed to Our Lady with her with a protective veil or cloth over cities during times of extreme persecution, trial. And, you know, that, that's the same with Constantinople. In his, in in uh, Kiev in Ukraine as well, these these kinds of events have have been known to occur in in our history, and so I think we'll we'll sign off with a uh, hail Mary, um, and asking our Our Lady, especially because, you know, I think that the conversion of Islam that will come through Our Lady. You know, she she if there's if there's something that if there's one avenue that I found, uh, at least in my limited anecdotal experience, uh, preaching and spreading the gospel amongst um, amongst our, our Muslim neighbors, it's you know it's the reverence for Our Lady, and and I think that you know she it's her will too. The triumph of her immaculate heart is going to be that everyone comes to know and love uh, her Son as our Lord, God, and Savior. So. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start the prayer and then, and then Alan, I'll ask you to, to finish and we'll sign off. So in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit, amen. In the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit, amen. In the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. And may God provide the increase.